you also have a lot of experience working with women who have menstrual irregularities, including PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So let's zero in a little bit on PCOS because it's yeah. affecting a larger and larger proportion of the American population. And I think there's a lot of women uh, who are struggling to understand what PCOS is and how they can actually treat it using their food. So can you help our listeners understand a little bit more about what is PCOS and how insulin resistance and why insulin resistance plays such a huge role in, uh, in that condition? Yeah. So, you know, most people don't even know they have it. Um, they have complaints like acne and menstrual irregularities or infertility and other things. And it's all, a lot of times it takes a long time before anybody's diagnosed. So it's basically the tendency to grow specific cysts, um, multiple cysts on the ovaries. But a lot of times because the cysts will come and go, that's not the first sign of it. So people don't notice it. And then eventually they notice, they get an ultrasound or whatever that there's cysts on their ovaries, but they might not even have that mid-cycle pain that usually you know, a cyst on the ovary would cause. They're, they're kind of silent. But the main cause of it, it was imbalance between testosterone and estrogen. So we have this buildup of testosterone and high levels of estrogen too, but the testosterone supersedes, but then lower levels of progesterone. And it disrupts their cycles. Sometimes it inhibits their cycles. And they develop male symptoms. So that's the acne and the facial hair. And that's usually what gets them, right? I suddenly have pimples and facial hair. You know, or they're 12 years old when they first, you know, don't get their period or their periods come every couple of months and, and it's disrupted. So insulin resistance plays a huge role in the polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so what we do is we look, I like to look at their blood tests and see, not the blood tests, but the urine tests. There's a specific test I like. It's, it shows the metabolites of all the hormones. And I look to see how do we reduce the testosterone and increase um, the progesterone in this person? And what I find is that because they've been eating a toxic diet, usually they are the ones that they love their sweets, they love their breads, they love their pizza. And this is disrupting the hormone balance. It's disrupting the digestive balance. So I really, I've started slowly with people to work on helping with the digestion, cleaning up the digestion, cleaning up the liver, helping to support the liver detoxification, and then looking at how do I get them to be making more progesterone rather than so much of that. And a lot of that goes into pathways and stuff. But in general, it's reducing the high sugar, high glycemic foods, um, getting off of the pesticides, uh, moving to a more whole foods plant-based diet with a lot of antioxidants and support. B vitamins is very critical for this, these pathways. And most people who are eating refined foods don't get enough B vitamins because they've stripped them out and they're not eating enough whole foods. I would say that, and, and we also get them to get a glucose meter and test and see where their levels are. Because most of the doctors don't do this. They just test fasting glucose. They don't look at hemoglobin A1C. They don't look at the insulin levels. And when you look at that, you can detect somebody that's going towards diabetes decades before. And don't you want to save somebody from going to diabetes? But they don't do it until they're diabetic. They don't check the hemoglobin A1C and they go, oh, your hemoglobin A1C is 11. Well, it's a red flag to me if it goes over 5.2 right? They're heading in the wrong direction. And if it gets to 5.5, I'm a little concerned because what that means is their average blood glucose is somewhere in the high one teens. And if the average is in the high one teens and you've got the lower like 85 because you have a fasting glucose of 85 and that's what it is all night, you must be going pretty darn high during the day and that's damaging, right? So we look at how do we balance their glucose and empower them to take their meters and track it and map it out. The newest thing that I absolutely love, but it's not available readily yet, you still have to need a prescription, is this thing called the Freestyle Libre. And it's a continuous glucose meter. I wear this little patch on the back of my arm. I turn the meter on, and this is how I test my glucose. That's it. It's great. Simple. Yeah. They can test we're, it we're big fans of uh, CGMs. I, I personally use the Dexcom. The Freestyle Libre is a great option. Yeah. Uh, 
I know yeah. they're working to get an option that will communicate proactively. That's the, that's what makes a Dexcom so good because it'll yeah. beep for type one if at night. You know, it's good to yeah. That's that's really more for type ones who who yeah. have that issue right where they have to watch for the lows. But I think that for the average person who's like pre-diabetic or pre-insulin resistance, as I like to say, that this is a great option because they just at will can do it. But even if they miss, like if they don't test it, they can look back and as long as they test it within eight hours, the thing, this thing is keeping track of it. Absolutely. And all the data goes in there. So I could see, oh, whoa, I was out at a party tonight and uh, my glucose went up to 140. What the heck did I do there, right? And it gives yeah. so much power. So I like to empower people to take charge. And I also recommend that they go to, there's a lot of direct access lab companies out there now. Go to the direct access lab company. You'll wait for your doctor to order it. Just go to the lab company and order a hemoglobin A1C and a fasting insulin and see where you're at. Then you can take charge and you can take control. Then you can shift and you can say, oh, well, that food made my sugar go up. No, but that food kept it steady. And there's actually, what I found in doing this with people, there's actually not always a rhyme or reason to it. Because one person can eat a banana or two bananas or five bananas in a smoothie and nothing happens to their sugar. It goes up a few points and then comes right back down. Other people can eat a half a banana and their sugar shoots up to 180, 200. And knowing that is so empowering because we can know exactly what foods we need. Now, the hope is that I put them on a metabolic reset, 30 days, and they stay away from all the foods that raise their sugar uh, too much. If they're diabetic, then we, we can't use the 110 guideline. But if they're diabetic, it's like anything that raises your sugar more than 20 points when you eat it, we're staying away from for 30 days. And it, it makes such a dramatic difference. And then at the end of that, it allows the insulin receptors to rebuild themselves because they're not being bombarded with insulin constantly. We want to keep that insulin level down really low during that 30 days. And then they don't get bombarded. And usually they start to test things back and they go, oh, I can eat a handful of blueberries now. Oh, I can eat a third of a banana now. And it changes over time. And it's more than just food, right? We look at the, the mental aspects. We look at the stress levels. We teach them ways to get that down. We look at um, sleep. Sleep is super important. Tons of studies on the effects of sleep deprivation on insulin resistance. Uh, we look at fitness. We have them do some burst training, you know, 30 seconds of good all out burst training several times a day can be dramatic for dropping it. Sometimes we talk about intermittent fasting if that's appropriate for them. So it's really, that's the customization that comes in, but the results are usually phenomenal. Yeah. This message of really having people taking control of their own health is so, so important, especially with the resources available today. And a lot of these tests are not that expensive compared to some of the supplements people are using or with other places they're wasting money, whether that be restaurants or alcohol. You can yeah. really take control. So that's a great message. Um, you already touched a little bit on the health benefits of mushrooms, but we want to go into a little more detail on their ability to alter testosterone and estrogen balance. And how important are mushrooms in particular for women experiencing menstrual irregularity? Yeah, so, um, so first of all, it, it, there's specific mushrooms and then there's general mushrooms. And, you know, I, I, don't wanna, I don't like the this for that approach. So I don't like to say, well, this mushroom works for this hormone or that. Because it's really about balance and what's going on with them. So if their imbalances have to do with a faulty immune system, then we want to look at what foods really support those things in the immune system. So uh, reishi and chaga are super important in that regard. If they have low stamina and they, they need more energy or they have some lung issues or some kidney issues, the, the cordyceps mushroom is super important for that. The brown mushrooms are super important as a, they're aromatase inhibitors. So aromatase being the hormone that uh, converts the testosterone to estrogen. So in PCOS, this may not be as appropriate because a lot of folks, they have too much testosterone compared to the estrogen and we wanna enhance the aromatase activity. But aromatase is an enzyme that converts from testosterone to estrogen. And so for people who are having crazy cycles, you know, we can look at the mushrooms do a really good job of inhibiting that. I see this a lot in men. This is especially important in men who have low testosterone and they go to the doctor and they get tested and the doctor says, oh yeah, here's some testosterone. I don't want to give somebody, recommend anything that's either a booster of testosterone or that 
is testosterone if they are aromatasing heavily. So for example, I will look not just at a blood test, I'll look at, a, a, there's this t test called the Dutch test that goes four different times during the day and you look at the patterns and it, it gives us all the metabolites. So if I see that their testosterone is high then um, and their estrogens are on the low side, then I'm going to recommend some things, some herbs and some foods and also reducing their insulin because those things will help the, which enhance the body's conversion, right? So if a man, if, I, if they take testosterone and they're, because they're low and that testosterone doesn't stay as testosterone, it gets converted to estrogen, that's, that's not a good thing to do because that could be dangerous, right? And the same thing in women. We see that a lot. We just want to look at what's really going on there so that we can help them to move in the right direction. Does that make sense? And then there's also with testosterone, there's this thing called DHT, and DHT is a very potent testosterone. And if someone is deficient in zinc or essential fatty acids, they can actually be making more of this DHT from the testosterone. And so we want to replenish them. What foods are rich in zinc? We give them some pumpkin seeds. Maybe have to do a zinc supplement for a little while while we're getting there. My goal is to always have people relying on food as their medicine. But in an interim, if somebody's got some serious stuff going on, maybe we just pop in with some concentrated nutrients for a short time and then pop out and make it go to the food. The reality is a lot of people aren't willing to go to the extent of doing the diet and lifestyle changes that we all know are important. And so we got to work with people where they're at and maybe give them some supplements to help them along.